has anybody in here been in an escape room? An escape room. I'm not talking, has anybody served time in prison? I'm not talking about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was me. Yeah. Uh, no. How many have been in an escape room? Okay. okay. Yeah. Did you like it? It was fun. Yeah. Did you work as a team to get out of there? Yeah. That's, that's the whole thing is you want to get out. Uh, the average time to break out of an escape room. Do you know what it is? No. You're close. An hour and 15 minutes. Now, they have little cameras on you to watch you. I'm sure if you're claustrophobic and you hyperventilate, um, <laughs> they push the button. I, I, I guess they get you out. I don't know if anybody's been in there for like days and weeks at a time. No food, no water. Um, but the Georgetown location uh, is uh, offering four different uh, themes uh, that you can in- enjoy. Uh, here's the four themes. Uh, you can go to the Friday the 13th theme with Jason. With the mask and everything. I think I'll pass on that one. Uh, there's Ghostbusters, Runaway Subway. That's all too familiar, isn't it? No, I don't, I don't want to do that one. And then the last one is the Titanic. What happens in the Titanic? Yeah, it's pretty simple, you know. So they lock you in a room. There's a little portal you want to get out, and before the water pours in, and you drown. That's, that's a restful way to spend a Saturday night. Uh, <laughs> But how do you get out of there? you got to pay attention to the clues, right? So if you don't pay attention to the clues and you all fight against each other, you're in there. Like you're stuck in there. But you got to listen to the clues, talk to each other, work together, and eventually, voila, the door opens and you get out, correct? I mean, basically how it works, from what I've heard from people that have gone in. Um, I cannot help but look at that and, and understand that if Paul the Apostle walked the planet, he would love that thing. Why? Because it's a, it's a theological statement, isn't it? I mean, it truly is. And like, in what way? Well, all you got to do is read the book of Romans, and you can see the first three chapters, it's about an escape room. It just has a different motif. So Georgetown has four to choose from. Paul would say, uh, we need to add a fifth one. Well, what's the name of that room? Sin. Everybody's born into the escape room called sin. Now, there's some differences between the escape room of sin and, and the uh, or in, in, the, in the, the entertainment version. Um, but the motif is similar. You have to follow the clues to get out. If you don't follow the clues, you don't get out. And Paul would say, yeah, that's exactly what sin is like. You're born into the, the room of sin, and to escape, you can't get out on your own efforts. You have to follow the clues that God gives you. That's what chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Romans are about. First, he says in uh, chapter 1, by way of review, um, Gentiles are born in the escape room of sin. So when the Jews heard that in the church of Rome, what'd they say? Oh, that's exactly what Gentiles are like. They are so sinful. They are not like us. We have the law, the Torah, beautiful pedigree, goes back to Abraham. If anybody is going to see heaven, it's us. And then Paul spends chapter two and three speaking to his Jewish brethren to tell them, uh, you're just as guilty of being in the escape room of sin as the Gentiles. I'm sure it got really quiet in the church when he was honest with them. But the escape room of sin, you, you cannot... Get out of that based on your own efforts, as Paul's going to say. And he says we're all born in that room. He's going to talk in uh, these verses before us, and we're going to spend two weeks uh, studying this motif. He's going to ask a Socratic question uh, in the background of this text of uh, uh, verses 19 and following. A very simple question. The, the question is this. If we're all born in that because of our relationship to Adam, we're born in this uh, room of sin, and, and it'd be nice if we could get out of there, how do we get out? I mean, what is God's plan to help non-believers, non-Christ followers escape the room of sin. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not a two-point, uh, this is not a three-point sermon. Do not hyperventilate on me. It's two points. Okay, you promise? So if you walk out of here going, what in the world was he talking about? It's two points. Two points. Two answers. First is the bad news. Then is the good news. So such is the nature of the gospel. So what Paul is going to tell us, he's going to answer the question, what is God's escape plan for sinners? He's first going to tell you the wrong way to try to escape from the, the room of sin. The wrong way. Verse 19. He says, now we know that everywhere the law says it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh, Jew or Gentile, will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. He just said a whole lot there. He says this is the wrong way to freedom from the escape room of sin. Uh, he says, first of all, now we know. Who's the we? I thought Paul was writing the letter. He, he's using the we as we Jews know. 
Now, he, I don't know if you're really into grammar before lunch. Are you? I am. <laughs> yeah. Are you really? <laughs> yeah. It's, so if you look at this in your Bible and you assume, you know, past, present, or future tense, this we know thing, is it past, present, or future tense? It's a present tense. It looks like a present tense. But if you read it in Greek, it is an unusual tense. It's called the perfect tense. Now, when you see the perfect tense in the Greek text and you, and you read in Greek, you must stop and ask yourself, why did he pick the perfect tense, not the present tense? Well, that's most interesting because if, when you study grammar, uh, Greek grammar, uh, a perfect tense denotes grammatically a past act with an abiding result, an un- un- uninterrupted result. He says, we Jews, we have a complete intrinsic understanding of like what God gave us in the law. I mean, if anybody knows about the wonders of the Mosaic law, it's us. And we know he's talking about the Mosaic law because he calls it the law, not a law indefinite, but the law. So if you're trying to classify that uh, Greek part of the Greek article, the, you have a couple options. It can either be the monadic use of the article, meaning the one and only, like the sun, the moon, or it can be uh, the par excellence, par excellence use of the article. There's nothing like the Mosaic law. But he says, if anybody understands what God wants, it's we Jews have got it. Uh, we understand the law of God and what God has given to us because he revealed himself to us. He just uh, spent some time uh, in the verses prior that we looked at last week talking about how all men are born under sin. They can't get away from it, Jew or Gentile. And he quoted from Isaiah and the Psalter as he went through that long list that we studied last week, uh, vacillating at different components of the Old Testament to talk about how man is a sinner, Jew or Gentile. He talked about the whole Old Testament talks about this in the law. Uh, when the Jews look at their Old Testament, they've come up with a, a word called the Tanakh. Tanakh. Uh, it, what's that mean? Well, it's an acronym. One of them must have been in the military because they came up with an acronym. I mean, when I moved here t- 10 years ago, in fact, Liz just told me yesterday, and I was like, oh, that's absolutely true. 10 years ago, this weekend is when we came out from California to candidate here to see if you, know, if you wanted us and we wanted you. I guess it worked. I mean... I, I came and you stayed and then more came. So um, we, we came out here. Uh, and I, you know, as, a, as a young man, I was wondering, like, what, is the, what does Tanak mean? Well, then I moved here. And the original elder board when, that was uh, around when I was hired, there was, they were all military. So there was a Navy captain, a lieutenant colonel, and I think the rest were colonels. I didn't even think I'd ever met a colonel in my entire lifetime in California. Uh, and I, I learned early on when they had an elder meeting, half the meeting was, was uh, given in uh, acronyms. I kept having to raise my hand. What are you talking about? And then when they were using words, I didn't even know what they were talking about. Like, what's a bogey? I mean, things like this. And so I had to learn a lot. So TANAC, what's that mean? T stands for Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, the N stands for the Nebaim, or the prophets, prophetic writings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Uh, and then the, uh, the C, or the K word, sounds like a katavim. Katav means to write, the writings, all the historical documents and stuff. Paul says the entire Old Testament was given to us by God, and it tells us exactly what he wants, what his law is, what his law is. Does obedience to the standard of the law that God gave throughout the entire Old Testament get a person out of the escape room called sin? I mean, can you work your way out? Paul says, uh, no. No, you can't. The law does not commend you to God. It condemns you. I mean, as he says here, he says it leaves you speechless. It leaves you speechless. It leaves you with no argument. Uh, Those who are born, notice what he says. The law closes every mouth, every mouth. If you read Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says on judgment day that sinners will have the audacity to stand before his throne and argue with him why they should go into heaven based on their own performance. He says, I will look at them and I tell them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I don't know you. I don't know you. The law just condemns you. It doesn't, it doesn't commend you to God. It leaves you speechless. Have you ever been arrested? I mean, don't raise your hand, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Last night. You know. uh, you've ever been arrested? I mean, I grew up in a law enforcement family. Dad's a federal agent. I mean, he put people in jail. So remember what I told you when I first moved here? And I performed my first wedding. Remember I told you? I told you this story. Remember? Some people are new. I have to tell the story again. But it's, it, it, there's not, it's so applicable this, to this passage. Because I totally understand standing before a judge and being totally guilty, you can't argue with him. Because when I did my first wedding here, in California, anybody can marry anybody. I mean, you, whatever. I mean, I did weddings there for 20 years. I never had a license. Then I moved here. 
what is D.C. and Virginia about? You have the license for everything. So I did my wedding, you know, uh, the, the couple, I did the whole thing. Afterwards, uh, the dad walked up and gave me the documents to sign, you know, the, the license. I'm signing my name on there. And then it said, my, I just froze when I saw it. Ministerial license number. You ever watch cartoons and the eyeballs pop out and ooga? It was like that. It was like feeling like that. Uh, and, and, and I had to look at the dad and I told him, uh, I don't have one of those. It's an illegal wedding. <laughs> you going to tell the couple? I'm not. <laughs> we'll tell them when they come back. Remember the story? You know? Yeah, so, you know, so I went to the courthouse, told them, you know, gave them the documentation, told her that I don't have a ministerial number. And she was totally, like, no emotion, expressionless. Uh, you've committed a crime. You've broken the law. You know, it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I admit it. Okay. Uh, like, how, like, what's the fine? $90. I'm like, I can do that. Okay, $90, wrote out a check, handed it to her. I start walking away from the window, and she's like, where are you going? I go, I I paid my $90. She goes, you got to go to court. Court? Why do I have to go to court? You have to see a judge. I don't want to see a judge. You don't have a choice. (laughs) 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 It's unbelievable. So the day comes, you know, I break the news to the couple and tell them, and, you know, after they come back from the honeymoon, oh, and by the way, that was illegal. Um, so they went with me, and I went before the judge, and they call my name, a whole courtroom full of people, you know, um, the state of Virginia versus Martin Baker. <laughs> Bad sounding. New pastor, new church. Oh, great. Hard a criminal. When, when I approach the bar, and, and like, why is the judge elevated? You know, I'm scared to death. I'm, you know, he's in a black robe. Scary enough. They call me. I walk up there with the couple, and he starts laughing while I'm walking up there. Oh, you're the guy that married somebody without a license. You know, uh, that's me. Tell all the whole courtroom. Now, could you imagine if I would have stood there and argued with him? I mean, imagine how that would have gone over. Hey, judge, man, I just moved here from L.A. or California. You know, I mean, just, hey, I did weddings for, you know, 20 years. You know, how about a little leniency here, a little grace? You know, don't be so hard-nosed. How'd that, how would that go for me? Not. No, he'd hit the buzzer, the gavel, whatever they do. You're guilty. <laughs> See, this is what Paul says, you know, uh, God gave us the law to condemn you, to let you know you're guilty. You can imagine the arguments at the, at the throne room of God for the law, standing there, who tried to get out of the escape room of sin on their own efforts. They didn't make it. So they're standing before God, the arguments, hey, Lord, you know, I, I totally believe that tolerance was the highest virtue a man could have. I mean, I taught everybody about tolerance. I tolerated anything and everything. Silence. You're guilty. You rejected the law. Ooh, wait, wait, wait a minute, Lord. I, I was all for relativism. I, mean, I bought into it hook, line, and sinker. I mean, I totally believe there's no absolute truth. I totally believe there's no absolute truth. Really? Silence. You're guilty. The law just merely condemned you. Condemned. Such is the nature of people. They'll argue at the throne room of God, and they're guilty because that's what the law does. It tells you you have broken the law. It can't fix you. It just condemns you. Verse 20, Paul says, because, why why you're in your predicament in that escape room of sin, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Why? Well, for the law comes the knowledge of sin. It doesn't fix you spiritually. It just tells you that you sinned. Remember when I did the illegal wedding? It just told me I did an illegal wedding. I couldn't, it it didn't fix me. It didn't fix me. He says the only way you can get justified by God, the holiness of God, Uh, It's to come on God's terms. What does it mean to be justified? Well, if you look up that, this great word of the book of Romans, but if you look up that word justify uh, in Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich's uh, lexicon to the New Testament Greek, it's the leading lexicon to Greek. It's going to give you four lexical options. Number two is the option you want, where God is the subject of the justification. It says in that lexicon that justification means you take someone who's guilty in a court of law, and the judge decrees that they're not guilty. They're acquitted. How, do, how, do you, how does that happen? Well, Paul says, let me tell you how it doesn't happen. You don't acqu- get acquitted as a sinner in God's heavenly throne room by your own performance. That's not how it happens. But our world is full of people who have not got the memo. I mean, there's a lot of religions in our world that are full of nice people, well-meaning people, and they all believe that they can get into heaven or whatever it is based upon performance. Uh, when I was... Uh, um, uh, studying the Quran with a, a doctoral class last semester. Uh, I read in a variety of books, uh, and one of the books that I read was uh, by Ron Rhodes, a great scholar, 
Uh, he wrote a book called Reasoning from the Scriptures with Muslims. The chapter on salvation. Notice the works that they build into the salvation. He says the Quran teaches that if a person has any hope of salvation, it will be based on pleasing Allah by good works. And then he quotes Surah, chapter 23, verses 102 to 103 to validate the point. And it reads this, quote, In the day of judgment, those whose balances shall be heavy with good works shall be happy. Whose balances shall be light are those who will lose their entire souls and shall remain in hell forever. Pretty simple. That's just one proof text. How do they say you should get into heaven? Have lots of good works for Allah. I mean, whatever those are. Five pillars of the faith, you know, doing alms, all that, you know, all that you do. Observing Ramadan, all that you do. Do all those things and have enough over on that one side of the scale that when God sees you, he'll go, oh, you should come in based on that performance. If you don't have enough, you're not getting in. You know, the thing is, you would never know if you really did enough to ever please God. But Paul says, that's, uh, that's not how a person gets justified, as nice as that might be. That's the bad news. You stay locked in the room if you're trying to get out of it based on your own performance. What's the good news? What's the right path out of the room? Well, God gives you clues. In fact, he's going to give you four clues. You should follow these. Here's what he says. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. I mean, it's clearly seen. Being witnessed when? Well, by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all of those who believe, for there's no distinction. God doesn't care about how much you're worth, who you know, what your degrees are. Everybody's the same, Jew and Gentile. It says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Paul says, let me explain to you the way out of the escape room called sin. He mentions four things here of the path out, the clues. Number one, well, the path out focuses on the past. Well, what's the past say? Remember back in Romans chapter one, verse 17? Here's what Paul said back then. It says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. He's quoting from uh, the prophet, minor prophet Habakkuk, chapter two, verse four. Why is he quoting Habakkuk to talk about faith? Because he says, all throughout the Old Testament, God told you the law condemns, but if a man wants to get justified and declared righteous before God, he says, even Habakkuk told us, even way back then, you come by faith in the person of God and what he's done for you. He said it's all over the Old Testament. It focuses on the past. God's manifested grace to you, not works. Uh, Verse 22, the right path focuses on a, a person. Notice what he says. Even the righteousness of God Through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of those who believe, not those who believe in work, but those who believe. By the way, what what does it mean to believe? It's not just mental assent. The, the, The demons believe in who Jesus is, but do they believe on him? Big difference. They believe that he exists and that he is, but they don't believe on him as Savior. He says, if you want to uh, get out of the escape room of sin, he says, you must uh, know the past. God's told you it's by faith. Is, then man is justified, and it focuses on the, the person of Jesus. Don't you love prepositions? I do. You love prepositions? A lady wrote me this week and wrote me a long email, and at the end of it, she told me she was retired, and then she told me, would you please not correct my grammar? <laughs> like, no. And the letter was fine. It was well written and everything. But if you do write me and there's a dangling participle or something, I, I won't freak out, okay? Uh, what's Paul say here? He says, uh, let's pay attention to the preposition through. Even the righteousness of God, how do you get it? Because my righteousness on its best day is unrighteousness if I don't know God. He says, you need the righteousness of God, and it comes by means of Jesus. He's he's the gate. It comes through him, which it means it doesn't come through you at all by your performance. It's for all of those who believe. Well, what does it mean to believe? I don't know what you've done this summer. Have you gone on a radical ride? No radical rides? You just stayed here and worked all summer so far? You need a vacation. Yeah. When you get on a roller coaster and you're going to go, you know, be shot out, you know, to infinity at 100 miles an hour, I mean, aren't you like doing some mechanical analysis? I mean, asking yourself some questions before you subject your body to that? I mean, you're analyzing it, you know, has, has, has this thing ever like come off? the rails, you know? Anybody ever like fallen out, you know, as they're, they're turned upside down from this little strap thing? I mean, like what? You know, ask some, ask some questions. But you can ask questions all day long. You're not a true believer until what point? You're on it. You're on it. You're on it. 
I mean, Liz and I, uh, on our sabbatical, uh, and, and with all the issues with her mom uh, being uh, given six months to live and all the stuff we were facing out there while we were out there uh, doing sabbatical, I, I said, you need a respite. We're going to go to Disneyland one day. So we did. One day, just us. It was fun. She loves fast rides. I haven't been on the Matterhorn, and I don't even know when. You been on it? I mean, I get on it, and I'm sitting there thinking, I remember getting on this back in 1968 with my grandpa. And back then, it was two people per seat. Now it's one per seat. And I remember back then thinking when I was a little kid, man, this is radical and awesome. I can understand why there's not a lot of older people riding those rides. (laughs) I got off there, and my brain felt like it was like flipped upside down in my head, it was jostling us back and forth. But I didn't become a f- true believer in the bobsleds until I actually got in there and then clicked the lock on. And then they got to check me as I'm going out. Please pull on the yellow tab. <clears throat> yeah, because I don't want to end up ejected at the top, right? I'm not a believer until I actually step in. See, you don't get out of the escape room of sin until you actually just don't have information about Jesus, but you believe in him to be the savior for your sinful situation. His work, not your work. Totally different. That through is a big preposition. It also focuses this deliverance from the escape room of sin on your predicament. You gotta realize you got a problem. What's the problem? Verse 23, for all have sinned. And the result is, notice the cause effect relationship. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's absolutely holy. Well, how, how holy would you have to be to please him? Perfectly holy. Well, what's your problem? You're a sinner. I mean, think of the big 10 commandments. You might be able to do the first nine. What's gonna get you? The last one. That coveting thing, try to go through a day and not covet. And we had our bathroom remodeled last year because Nathan's 6'4 and needed a taller uh, bathtub and everything. So we had a contractor come in and I had to blow some walls out to increase it for the bigger tub and everything. So the, the contractor came in and he at one point had this, this laser level, looked like a box. He put it in there and shot these l- l- laser lights everywhere. I've got to have one of those. <laughs> I don't know what for. I'm not laying tile or anything, but like that is amazing. I mean, I'm sitting there using a ruler and everything to figure out level. He just goes, bink, and there it was. Have you got one? It was sin. I mean, (laughs) I can't get through the day and not want one of those things, et cetera, because it's coveting. So you you can't, you have a problem. You're born, as Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You can't work yourself into God's presence because of what Galatians chapter 3 says, Paul writing, he should know, rabbinical scholar, etc. Notice what he says to the Galatian church, chapter 3. He says in verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by, what? All things. All things written in the book of the law to do what? To form them, to perform them. You, you can't do it on your own because, well, you're sinful. You're sinful. You need somebody bigger than you who's not sinful to fulfill the law, that's Jesus. Think about two guys on a boat, a big boat. They're sailing from, let's say, New York to Lisbon. And somehow, some weird, you know, say 60-foot swells, whatever, they both get swept over, and they land in the water halfway between New York and Lisbon, and they're going to Lisbon. And they're floating around, and so you bob up out of the water after you hit, you know, hit the, the water, you know, 10 floors up, and you hit the water. And so you look at the one guy, and you're like, hey, man, you know how to swim? And the guy's like, uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I took some Red Cross lessons as a kid. <laughs> Too bad for you. I mean, I, I swam in high school. Uh, I swam competitively in college. Uh, you know, tried out for the Olympic team, et cetera. You know, I had to swim. I'm going to probably outswim you. Where are they going? Lisbon. Where are they? Middle of the ocean. Either guy going to make it? No. Why? Physically, it's impossible. So this is what Paul's saying. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. They, you're never going to make the holiness of God. Why? Because you, you're, it's in, you, you, you can't do it. It's incapable. You're incapable to do it because you're sinful. So what do you need? You need someone who's not sinful to fulfill the law. That's, that's the work of Jesus. You have a predicament. Jesus is the answer to the predicament, as you see in verse 24. Being justified by what? A What? A gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. We'll get to that other proposition next week. I just want to focus. You're justified, declared righteous as a sinner, freed from the room of sin, the escape room of sin, by a, a gift. Do you work for a gift? No. It's a, it's a gift of grace. 
means he freely gives it to you. You don't deserve it, but he, he gives it to you anyway. The salvation is a, is a free gift that he paid for. You don't work for it. He did all the work for you. I don't know about you on Judgment Day. I am so glad when I stand before God, I don't have to tell him all the things that I did that he should allow me into heaven because that would be insufficient. I, I can just say, Lord, thank, thank you for the gift of grace. That I took the gift. Have you ever taken the gift? I mean, have you ever told the Lord, my works are insufficient and I realize that I need the gift of grace? How does a person enter uh, heaven and get out of the escape room of sin? You're honest enough with yourself to say, yes, I'm a sinner and I need the grace given to me that can only come through Christ. How do you get it? You simply ask him. And what's he do? He gives you that gift. The minute that open, op- happens, the gears of that room open and it swings open into a heavenly relationship. Uh, never to be closed again for you. You're free. You get out of that room. There's a lot of people who do not understand that. I mean, what grace really means. Uh, I, I submit to you a couple of names of people who do not understand how to get out of that room. Number one, Muhammad Ali. Before he died, this is what he said about heaven. He says, one day we are all going to die. Was he right? Yeah, yeah, astute analysis. Uh, One day we're all going to die, and God is going to judge us, our good deeds and our bad deeds. He says, if the bad outweighs the good, you go to hell. If the good outweighs the bad, you go to heaven. What book should he have been reading? Romans. Romans chapter 3, 19 and following, because Paul says, uh, Muhammad, Mr. Ali, uh, that is not how you get into heaven. It's not got anything to do with your works. They're tainted by sin. It's all about the work of Christ. Mr. Ali, have you taken the gift? Uh, do you know, this is probably going to date myself, so i sorry for this, but uh, do you know who Sophia Loren is? Yeah, actress, et cetera, very world-renowned, et cetera. Here's what she said about uh, heavenly uh, things. She says, I'm not a, practice, a practicing, uh, I don't practice Christianity, but I do pray. I read the Bible. It's the most beautiful book ever written. I, Sophia, should go to heaven. Otherwise, it's not a nice place if I don't get to go. I'm not done reading. Uh, She said, I haven't done anything wrong. Whoa. My conscience is very clean. Uh, My soul is as white as those orchids over there, and I should go straight, straight to heaven. Wow. What has she not fully understood? You don't, Sophia. I know your name means wisdom in Greek. You're not being wise on this one because, well, the wise person understands your works are insufficient. Salvation is gained based on a gift. The gift is Christ. I leave you with one final uh, illustration of a person who, at the time, I don't know where they are now, spiritually speaking, but at the time, uh, didn't get the picture back in 2015. Uh, Rob Lowe, you know Rob Lowe, the actor? Uh, one time I was um, at um, Magic Mountain with my uh, children. And I was, we were at this radical roller coaster. I was getting ready to get on. You're kind of waiting to see, am I going to fall to be able to get in the first seat? And I was with Liz and Nathan and Amanda. And, and everything was falling to where I'm going to get the front seat. This is going to be fun. And right as I'm about to get in, the, the worker came in and kind of said, hey, buddy, wait just a minute. I'm like, what? That's my seat. Uh, no, this other man uh, has preference. He's coming in before you. It was Rob Lowe. I still have issues with it. It was back in the 90s. <laughs> Rob, you know, came in with his son, sat in the front seat. I sat right behind him. I just wanted to tap my mom on the back. Hello. It's my seat. But I didn't. I just, I was good. But anyway, here's what Rob says. This is the most interesting. He says, I try to hold on to the things I believe to be good and true. Uh, good things happen to good people. Karma is real. There is a larger, better plan for all of us if we stay positive and keep pushing and get out of our own way. Rob. Karma's not real. (laughs) Uh, I mean, you can uh, do all the good things you want to and all your births and rebirths. You're not going to get out of the wheel of death. Only the grace of Jesus that a man receives gets him out of sin. It's real. It's real. A lot of people don't understand that they're locked in that room and they can't work their way out of it. The only way out of it is to receive the gift. I have a simple question. Have you ever come to Christ to say, Lord, I desperately need that gift? Uh, We have counselors over here. They're here every Sunday. They would love to introduce you to the gift called Christ. And he gives it to you based on grace. You don't have to work for it. Aren't you glad he did all the work on Calvary for you? He bore your sin. When my sister was passing away uh, back in April from cancer, my sister Marla, um, so they were with her in the hospice house. My family, my little sister, my mom, and my brother-in-law. My sister had been a Christian singer 
toured the country, blah, blah, blah. Um, so she's comatose. Well, so many hours before she died, she started singing. She'd been comatose. She was singing. She knows she's dying, she's singing. And my little sister taped it. I, I still can't watch it. I haven't even told her to send it to me. I couldn't watch it. But I will tell you what she was singing. She who was facing death itself was singing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. You know that song? This is my story. This is my song. She sings it all day long. She really does now. Why was she singing? Because she knew. She knew. And could she talk? She would have been able to tell you, I took the gift. I know where I'm going to be. Have you taken the gift? It puts a song in your heart, even in the face of death itself, because you have life that came from Christ. Let's pray. Father God, anybody in our church has never taken the gift of faith. Might this be the day they step forward? Maybe they don't even understand all the answers to the questions they have, but now they understand in a crystal clear fashion the person and the work of Jesus Christ to redeem them, a person that's far from you, is in a room locked up and needs to get out. Now they know they must turn to you, follow the clues to the cross, and you will give them the gift of grace and save them. For we who know you, might we be bold, uh, courageous, loving, compassionate, and uh, motivated to take that gift and give it to as many people around us as we possibly can, knowing indeed time is short. And thank you that when we do know you, we can sing, even facing death in itself. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. We have you because you most assuredly have us. In Jesus' name, amen.